What comes to mind when you think of the 1920s? Jazz? Economic prosperity? How about bigotry and hate speech directed at Catholics? To murder Protestants and destroy the U.S. government is the oath binding every Roman Catholic. Hear about convent horrors and the unlawful secret questions priests put to women and girls in the confessions box. If that last one doesn't come to mind when you think of the early teens and 20s, that's thanks in large part to the efforts of dedicated men and women who made up the Catholic Layman's Association, a group formed in Georgia to combat the rampant anti-Catholicism that could be found in newspapers at the time. Today, we're going to talk with Bishop J. Kevin Bolin and hear from Mr. John Mark Walter, a longtime and prominent member of the Catholic Layman's Association, on why the fact you might not have ever heard of the association means they were successful. It's Catholic, y'all. It's Catholic, y'all. It's Catholic, y'all. Welcome to It's Catholic, y'all a podcast series from the Catholic Diocese of Savannah. The Diocese of Savannah covers 90 counties in South Georgia, whose total population is less than 3% Catholic. Stories of life, love, and faith across cultures, traditions, and geography. It's Catholic, y'all! Now, Bishop Boland, when you first came to the diocese as Father Boland, what year was that? That was 1959. In September of 1959, I arrived in Savannah, Georgia. What was the diocese like for you when you first came here? Hot. (laughs) The temperatures were brutal. I was not used to weather where it's 80 and 90 degrees. Uh, Having come from Ireland where even in the hottest summers, it would be 50 or 60 degrees, and we would consider it roasting. What was it like to have such a large Protestant population in Georgia and to be the minority as a Catholic, even in the uh, the 50s like that? Initially, I was not aware of it because all of my kind of activity as a priest in the parish is that I was in a kind of a a Catholic enclave, if if, if you were. And uh, the presence of non-Catholics or people of other creeds was not part of my ministry at the time. So it was only over the years I became very much aware of how small we were as Catholic faith in the Diocese of Savannah, which at that time, of course, was the 90 counties of southern Georgia. Or yes, Did you experience or hear about any kind of the prejudice that might have happened decades before? Uh, very little of it, yes. Uh, very. I was not aware of it. I would have only become aware of it through reading and uh, through commentary from other priests who kind of lived through it. Uh, the high point, I, I would say, when I came here was the whole question of integration and black and white, which had overtones, no overtones of being Catholic or non-Catholic or Christian or non-Christian. It was just a black and white issue. I know one of the things that really interests me researching this topic was the what they call the VZ bill, the convent inspection bill that was passed in 1915. And for those who aren't aware of it, as, as I was not, this was a bill passed in the Georgia legislature that allowed inspection uh, ostensibly of any place where people lived. Um, but what was really targeted to was Catholics, the idea that they could come in and inspect a school or inspect a monastery or a convent. Uh, and it's not just a fire marshal looking for smoke alarms. It's that they'd come in inspecting under the understanding something devious or untort was going on. And what an affront to someone's religious freedom that might be. Uh, very much so. And the VZ bill, like in essence, when you, ins- when you look at it very carefully, it was bigotry. It was anti-Catholic. And it was that the Catholicism was kind of devious in its work with its people. And it was very much aimed at convents, which they just could not understand these ladies dressed peculiarly, uh, going about teaching. And it was this undercurrent of anti-Catholicism which led to an amazing thing, that law was passed where they could officially, at their will, inspect these locations. Uh, 
the concept, I guess, to a Catholic must have been unbelievable. Uh, that their kind of that their constitutional rights could be kind of taken away this way just because they were Catholic, and in the case of religious nuns, it was even more devious because they had committed themselves to this way of life that they could be officially inspected by a political power as to whether they were doing the right thing or not. And it's interesting. I mean, the, there definitely was a response from the Catholic community, and that was the founding of the Layman's Association. And we recently had a, had a chance to speak with a friend of yours, Mr. John Mark Walter in Augusta, who's, who really was very heavily involved in the Layman's through the 50s and 60s and had a chance to speak to us kind of about its, its history and its structure. Yes. Um, we're privileged, I think, to be able to kind of talk to Mr. Mark Walter, who is the last living individual that I know of who had direct contact and was involved with the Layman's Association. So he was able to enrich our archives, as it were, by telling us how it happened and why it happened and who were the leading figures in the Catholic Layman's Association, which on analysis for the time that they, you know, in the post-Vatican II church, we made an awful lot of mileage about parish councils and parish lay involvement, not realizing that before the Vatican II Council, this was present in some aspects in a very significant way in the Diocese of Savannah with the Catholic Layman's Association, which was completely lay, under lay leadership, with the endorsement and full support of the, of the bishop of the time. This is what Mr. Mark Walter had to say about it. Uh, it was founded in 1916 because of the bitter anti-Catholic feeling in the state of Georgia. Uh, back then, it was you. They, they, they called us filthy Catholic, dirty Catholics, and they were filthy Protestants. <laughs> and that's why the Bishop of Savannah was the power behind the founding of the Layman's Association. He called these men together from all over the state to see what they could do about it. And the Layman's Association was founded. Its motto was to bring about a friendlier feeling among Georgians, irrespective of creed. That's just really interesting to hear uh, Bishop Keeley call these men together, men and women from all over the diocese, and said, this is a problem we have. I trust you'll come up with a solution. and. I'm, I'm behind you fully. Let me know what you come up with. What, how does that strike you as a bishop, someone who's been in those positions before? How remarkable is that to you? For the time of 1916, it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, very, very significant. And if you see the closing words of his statement there, irrespective of creed, that this was something bigger and larger and more in and of more importance than just being Catholic, that there had to be freedom of religion, freedom of expression, no matter what creed you professed. So I would give great credit to my predecessor bishops who gave the lay people this go-ahead to do this and fully supported them. I, I would say it was a unique happening in the history of the church in the United States in some ways, you know. Granted, we're a small, insignificant diocese in some way because we had so few Catholics, but the leadership of those bishops was truly inspirational. Have you ever heard the letter that Bishop Keeley issued to the second meeting of this organization of talking about his support? No, I have not. No. It's really interesting to hear. I can no longer advise Catholics of the state to remain supinely silent under these grossly malicious, indecent, and calumnious charges. That they arise from gross ignorance as well as bigoted intolerance is no excuse. Of course, the perpetrators of these foul accusations have put themselves beyond the pale of controversy with gentlemen. But may it not be that there are in Georgia numbers of Protestants who can be reached by appeals to reason. There may be field here for effort on the part of this organization, which I trust will result from this meeting. A campaign of education may affect some good. The means and the method I am content to leave to this meeting, promising my earnest cooperation in everything they shall do. 
that's just so interesting to hear him say, you know, this is the problem we have. I think we can help. We can educate these people. You have my support. You have my support. I, that is delegation at its best. I know one of the things I started off doing, one of the most visible instances of, of prejudice or bigotry that the Catholics face were found in the newspapers that were letters to the editor and sometimes even articles and stories that were published that were blatantly wrong and blatantly bigoted. We spoke with Mr. Mark Walter about what the Layman's Association really did when it first started. They had meetings and groups. They had uh, uh, councils, sort of, in each uh, of the principal cities. There were about six Atlanta, Savannah, uh, Macon, Albany, Columbus, are the ones that stand Rome, Rome, Rome Georgia, Georgia, yeah, was the only one. Well, you know, back then it was Savannah, Atlanta, and Rome was Atlanta was about all we had north of us. North of it, yeah. And all these major cities, six or eight major cities, and they would go out and give talks and things like that on Catholicism, and they would uh, combat some of the letters to the editor and things themselves, the, the, the lay, lay people. Well, I cannot believe you are responsible for such nonsense appearing in your paper. You ought to have repudiated it long ago. I hope you will yet repudiate it, for it does no man honor to be silent while the enterprise he heads is used as a tool of ignorant hate to stir up enmity against his fellow citizens whose lives are not less upright than his own. I find that clipping from the Catholic Layman's Association archive so interesting because it's very well thought out, very well written, in response to an, what a lot of instances were very hate-filled comments about our faith that these people took the time to sit down and respond to in, in such an eloquent way. And you must hand it to the lay people of that era who were obviously very well educated in their faith, knew how to express and defend it, and a kind of a, an aura of we're proud of who we are and we resent and regret that you misunderstand what we stand for. We look upon sometimes that era of the early 1920s that, that the lay people were maybe not capable of that, but the opposite is true. They were very well educated. They were very much aware of who they were and how they represented their faith, but also that they were professional lay people in their own categories, whatever profession they may have followed. And uh, they're a great credit to the church and a great credit to how the church worked under those kind of difficult circumstances of living in the communities or communities that were hostile to their faith. But I think, too, it, it really speaks volumes that in, in a lot of times these papers would publish these responses in letters to the editors that the Catholic layman would write uh, and would actually give voice to a dissenting opinion that they had published in their paper. I think that really speaks to how education was really needed. And we see in some instances papers not allowing letters to the editor to be published in response. But in that instance, the Catholic layman bought ads in those papers to publish their messages. So it's, it's kind of by hook or by crook, they're going to they're gonna get their message out there. Get their message out, yes. And to think about today, we're recording in 2018, to think about in this era of social media, to think about eloquent viewpoints put out like that about your fate that's something that's almost alien to us because that's in the in the era of fake news and trolls you don't really hear that kind of speech out there true you do not and it's and so often in the new type of media it's not that eloquent because it's all sound bites or little phrases you know and uh, maybe i wonder if we've not kind of gone into a mode of not being conscious of who we are in the proclamation of the faith because it's not opposed anymore in that sense. There's, used to, there's a kind of a new atmosphere of, well, if that's what you want, that's fine. You know, I, I will not get in the way of it. Uh, so is that uh, the era of good dialogue and good uh, back and forth about positions 
in some ways, I think is a lost art today. And it's interesting with the laymen, they, they saw such value in the newspapers. They had a, an internal bulletin. They literally called the Bulletin of the Catholic Layman's Association. That was a newsletter for members, but that grew into the newspaper, the Bulletin of the Catholic Layman's. And Mr. Mark Walter talked with us about the newspaper being formed. When the first executive secretary came on, he issued a monthly newsletter, which he called the Bulletin. And when uh, Dick Reed came in 1920, he, well, I'm sure, working with the bishop, of course, they found, they changed, founded, they, it became an actual newspaper every month on a regular schedule. And that's how the Catholic press really was founded in this uh, area, in that whole area, because the bulletin at one time was the only Catholic newspaper between Baltimore and New Orleans. Oh my goodness. That's... Uh, and even when I was there, we were still serving Florida and North Carolina and South Carolina. They were still, they would chip in with the subscriptions sometimes. That's amazing too. When I recall what he says there about even Florida didn't have newspapers at that time, you know. I mean, that that's really shows the extreme cutting edge that they were on, that they were publishing a newspaper. And one of the things that's remarkable to me, and I, I know I'm using that word remarkable a lot, but for a story that I, I really had no exposure to to learn about, there are so many remarkable things about it. When you look at the original bulletins from the 20s and 30s, these were 36 and 40 page newspapers that were mostly texts. They were very, very dense newspapers that they were putting out on a monthly basis. Absolutely unbelievable in a way that they were able to do this, they were able to finance it because there was very little advertising to go, to offset the cost of this. So they must have been greatly personally involved too with the financial end of it to make it all happen. Uh, it's, it's a story that somehow needs to be told not only in our own diocese but beyond it, you know, to the what I call the newspaper world in general, you know. I think it's, it's interesting. I, in a large part, I think one of the reasons why I'd never heard of the Catholic Layman's Association before is because they were so successful. Between, you know, 1920 and 1960, they had these paper, or they had their paper, and they responded to secular newspapers, and they did such a good job with education that they were really able to push back against the bigotry that we experienced in Georgia at the time. And then by the 1960s, some of the goals of the Layman's Association had been met, and they almost worked themselves out of a job. Mr. Mark Walter talked to us about that. At what had happened, the interest, the solicitation of funds just dribbled away, and the Bishop of Savannah and the Archbishop, well, he wasn't Archbishop, the Bishop of Bishop Highland had to step in and fund it to keep the paper and keep the offices going. The diocese had to fund it. But with, I was going to say also the need, the vitriolic anti-Catholicism no longer existed at that time. Would, not really. Would that not be that true? Much. Every now and then you would get yeah. uh, a letter, you know what I mean? But it hardly existed. Not like it did in the 20s. Which, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like I say, the, I'm sure the... <coughs> The files down in Savannah are full of letters that uh, Richard Reed wrote and Farrell. Probably Richard Reed more than anybody else. That's just so interesting. And then even you as a priest coming to the diocese in the late 50s, to not really be aware of what the Layman's Association had done and, and the environment in which they grew up really speaks to what a great job they did in education. And I think a lot of people, when you see these, these comments that people made in newspapers, I don't think they necessarily hated Catholics. They just didn't know any Catholics. They didn't understand our faith. They had never been exposed to it. So when you hear these salacious and outrageous things, you have nothing to compare it to. But through the Catholic Layman's Association's efforts and education, and really we'd call it PR today, just to tell people what the, the doctrines of our faith are, it really combated that. We'd be forever indebted to the Catholic Layman's Association uh, for setting the the groundwork, the foundation for what we have today in the state of Georgia, uh, which now includes two dioceses, of course, 
Atlanta and Savannah, and spreading our wings even because there was involvement from uh, Charleston, especially southern part of southern of South Carolina, who, who all benefited from the work of the Layman's Association. So, but the, what they did is a monument to graciousness and a monument to a faith-filled uh, kind of mission to present what is right and, and, to, and to put away what is wrong or to correct the wrong impressions. I, I would ask the question, is there need for it today? Is there misrepresentation of the church today in today's society? Uh, probably not as much as there was then. The church is vilified in the 20s and 30s, misunderstood. There are many people today probably who don't like the church because it seems to be a powerful element for uh, news and change and involvement in society in general, which is a good thing because of our value system, so on and so forth, like social mores is the big thing today. It's interesting, one of the things that happened on the national level that went hand in hand with the decline of some of the bigotry that we saw in Georgia is, of course, in 1960, you had John Kennedy, a Catholic descended from Irish immigrants, elected president of the United States. Mr. Mark Walter really felt that this was the hallmark of the era, and it really let people know how far they had come. I, th and I think that's what caused it, because the a Catholic was finally president of the United States. And I could, I can, listening to that story there, I can see it happening. We're not getting all this abuse anymore. So no, we no, don't need this. The fight isn't there anymore. We don't need this. We, we don't need the money to, yeah. We don't need that money. And I would think a, a lot of people don't even realize that every two weeks they open their mailbox and there's a Southern Cross newspaper in it. And that's a legacy of the Catholic Layman's Association, that after their paper, the Bulletin of the Catholic Layman's Association, uh, you know, it, it kind of sunset. That then split off into the Georgia Bulletin, which is the paper of the Archdiocese of Atlanta, and the Southern Cross, which is the paper of the Diocese of Savannah. It's a sign of, in a certain sense, of the growth of Catholicism in able to present itself without controversy of a uh, bi-weekly newspaper as it is. And uh, is there danger that we take it for granted, not realizing the struggle it was to get our voices heard at one time in the history of the church? Um, or does the newspaper today have a different purpose and a different focus? Uh, do we address the national debate of things we don't like or that are contrary to, say, church teaching? I think that's part of it, but it's not the greater part of it because the secular newspapers are also divided. They, they don't have one voice either, like whether it's the Boston Globe or the New York Times or whatever the Philadelphia Inquirer, they can be at odds with each other because of their social position. I think of particularly of positions with regard to, uh, say, the right to life, the abortion issue, and uh, other issues way beyond the abortion issue now of transgender and all of that, which is a new era that we never even kind of figured uh, so maybe our newspapers are still necessary so as that we always give forth our Catholic position and our Catholic teaching on the sacredness of the human person and the sacredness of sexuality. I know it's, it's great for me, and I speak this not only as an employee of the diocese, but it's so interesting that what the Catholic Layman's Association did originally with letter writing campaigns and then later into a newspaper morphed into our diocesan newspapers and then our diocesan communications departments. And myself as a videographer, I primarily shoot and edit video. I also do podcasts and radio programs. But there's a place for me in the diocesan structure that recognizes and values communication and allows me to communicate with Catholics and non-Catholics our message, unalienated, unedited, 
uh, outside the control of bi- big business or secular media, we have a place where our, vo- our voice can be heard and we can tell our message to the people without any kind of middleman. And I think that's, that's something that people don't necessarily see the value in or understand the value in that people 100 years ago fought very hard for. And I think we can all kind of step back and, and look at that. Communication belongs to all of us, and it should not be in the domain only of those who, for the most part, is become a profit-making organization, a profit endeavor. For the Catholic Diocese of Savannah, it's something that we invest in because of its importance and because it is the new mode of communication for all of us, and the Catholic message must be part of it. We have a right to be there and a right to voice our opinions so as that we're heard in the, in the marketplace, the new marketplace of the universe, which is the world now. What do you think the legacy of Mr. John Mark Walter and his fellow Catholic laymen, what do you think that legacy is today? The legacy is they were foundational. They were doing the work uh, under, under duress, unlike that we are today. They're, they were fought against in that generic sense. Their legacy is, uh, is enriching, it's foundational, it's uh, something that we should be ever grateful for. And it was a blessing that we didn't realize that we had and that should enrich all of our lives because of what they did. We are, we are standing on the, phone, on the shoulders of giants uh, when we look back and examine how they did it, when they did it, and the difficulties that were theirs in doing it. And what I find very interesting is that you could say the concept of a bishop, as Bishop Keeley did, said, you know about this. Go and do it. And they did it. It is it's delegation in the best sense of the word, the delegation of support, but you are the ones who are capable of doing it. That's fantastic. And I, I hope our listeners really enjoy the story and then research it a little bit more and to see the, the legacy and the history of the Layman's Association. Right, yes. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me. And We hope we'll just, uh, all that we do will engender the lives of people and of society, yeah, in the best sense of the word. Thank you. And we'd like to extend a huge thank you to Mr. John Mark Walter for taking the time to talk with us. After starting work in high school with the Layman's Association as an office boy, his 43-year career saw him overseeing printing of the Bulletin of the Catholic Layman's Association, the Georgia Bulletin for the Archdiocese of Atlanta, the Catholic Banner and Catholic Miscellany for the Diocese of Charleston, and the Southern Cross for the Diocese of Savannah, where he spent 21 years as its editor. I'd also like to thank my coworkers here at the Catholic Pastoral Center for their help reenacting newspaper clippings in Bishop Keeley's speech. Thanks for helping us tell this story. If you'd like to learn more about the Catholic Layman's Association and the history of Catholic journalism, You can read back issues of the bulletin from 1920 to 1960, all archived online. Just do a search for the Bulletin of the Catholic Layman's Association of Georgia. Until next time, remember, it's Catholic, y'all.